This is Plant-Based Briefing, Hormone Replacement Therapy and the Opioid Epidemic, When Standard Therapies Become Dangerous, Part 2, by Nelson Huber Disla at NutritionStudies.org. And I'm Marian Erickson, host of this plant-based podcast where I curate and narrate with permission a variety of articles on healthy, compassionate, and sustainable living in about 10 minutes or less every weekday. And today's article is longer than that, so it's been split into two episodes. I read the first half yesterday, so go back and listen to that first. And in that episode, the author talks about the opioid epidemic and how, quote, overprescription and big pharma have killed hundreds of thousands of people, unquote. And then today's episode starts off where he continues by making a comparison to how hormone replacement therapy is being prescribed today and whether the inadequate testing and big pharma will also end up killing people. So now let's get to today's plant-based briefing. Hormone Replacement Therapy and the Opioid Epidemic When Standard Therapies Become Dangerous, Part 2, by Nelson Huber Disla at NutritionStudies.org. Hormone Replacement Therapy, How Inadequately Tested Drugs and Big Pharma, dot, dot, dot. The prescribing of estrogens and progestins for postmenopausal women has had a frightening history with several similarities to the more recent opioid epidemic. The history of these drugs serves as an excellent example of how different constituencies with competing objectives often collide to produce health practices and policies with questionable benefits and potential harm, write Naughton and others. They write that these hormones have been available in the U.S. for nearly a century, with Premarin being the most notable oral hormone used by postmenopausal women. Aggressive marketing of Premarin was documented by 1945, However, animal experiments more than a decade earlier had shown that conjugated estrogens induced cancer. Despite these valid concerns of carcinogenesis, the FDA approved their use in 1941. Evidence suggests approval resulted largely from concerted lobbying by drug companies aided by the cooperation from physicians. However, little was known regarding appropriate dosages and potential short- and long-term risks and benefits. It wasn't until stronger evidence of harm emerged from the Women's Health Initiative, WHI, many decades later that the practice met more significant pushback. As one commentator wrote in 2002, the most important part of this story has received little attention. Why did the medical and research community ever believe that HRT prevented or treated disease? For decades, physicians have acted as an unwitting volunteer sales force for pharmaceutical companies that have promoted HRT for disease prevention in the complete absence of controlled trials supporting this claim. Advertising and detailing have been only a small part of this campaign. Far more effective is the hidden influence that pharmaceutical companies have on the information that physicians receive. This quote gets at an essential detail. That menopause has become not only a stage of life, but also a multi-billion dollar industry for the pharmaceutical manufacturers that produce HRT, tells only one part of the story. It's not only the amount of money the industry is willing to spend on advertising that we need to be concerned about, it's also their malignant underhandedness. For instance, dozens of ghost-written reviews and commentaries published in medical journals and supplements were used to promote unproven benefits and downplay harms of HRT. Wyeth, the manufacturer of Premarin, plus common over-the-counter drugs like Advil and Robitussin, acquired by Pfizer for $68 billion in 2009, used this tactic not only to downplay the risks of their drugs, but also to promote off-label, unproven uses of HT, such as the prevention of dementia, Parkinson's disease, vision problems, and wrinkles. Such concerted misinformation campaigns, which are not limited to hormone therapy drug producers, have severe consequences— Even decades after the beginning of the Women's Health Initiative that began to raise alarms about the potential side effects of these drugs, many patients and providers remain misinformed about the risks and benefits of hormone therapy. In a 2020 article on older women's perceptions of the benefits and risks of long-term hormone therapy, researchers found that many women continue to use hormone therapy because of unfounded hopes of preserving youthful physical and mental function. The findings strongly suggest widespread distorted views of HT efficacy and risk, with all of the women interviewed expressing little concern for the risks of prolonged use. Also, recall how opioid producers not named Purdue Pharma responded to the void in the marketplace. Big Pharma, and other industries too, does not and never will respond to evidence of harm the way you or I would. Rather than wait for more in-depth studies, they seek to secure and then multiply their grossly obtained wealth. 
In the case of opioids, that means increasing spending and targeting the most vulnerable regions. In the case of cigarette smoking, it means systematically nurturing confusion, fear-mongering about governmental overreach, and propping up phony expert opinions. In the case of hormone replacement therapy, facing the alarming evidence from the WHI and a subsequent decline in consumer demand, it was inevitable that prescriptions would decrease and promotional spending would shift. Though promotional spending on the standard dose Prempro decreased following the WHI evidence, the company quickly turned its focus toward a lower dose formulation of the same product. Increased prescriptions for the new agent followed, but at what cost? All the time, it was still unknown whether simple dose reductions would be sufficient to alter the imbalance of harms and benefits. None of this is to say that all hormone replacement therapies are categorically dangerous or that they absolutely cannot provide any relief for certain symptoms of menopause. But why must we wait decades before these potential harms and benefits are properly assessed? Why should standard treatments race recklessly ahead of the evidence? And whose agendas are we serving? Have we learned our lesson? The two case studies introduced here, neither of which are resolved, illustrate that just because something is standard practice does not mean it's beyond questioning. The conflation of authority with truth is a lapse in logic far too common in matters of life and death. My doctor told me X is not sufficient proof that X is true. So where does that leave us? Should we automatically disbelieve what our physicians tell us and disregard advice for which there is a legitimate consensus? Obviously not. All things being equal, would any sane person reject treatment for a broken arm? I hope not. Iatrophobia, fear of doctors, and paranoia are foolish substitutes for blind faith in the medical profession's ever-evolving standards. Somewhere between the two extremes is a probably smarter and more empowering alternative that involves us trying to stay informed, advocating for yourself as much as possible, learning about preventive medicine, and keeping an open, critical mind. You just listened to Hormone Replacement Therapy and the Opioid Epidemic, When Standard Therapies Become Dangerous, Part 2 by Nelson Huber Disla at nutritionstudies.org. And I'm your host, Marian Erickson, and I wonder if you had the same thoughts when the author made the point about, in the case of cigarette smoking, the industry systematically nurtured confusion, fear-mongering about governmental overreach, and propped up phony expert opinions. That's exactly the way it is today with nutrition, with big food, animal egg, big pharma, because that's tied in. Something like 70% of antibiotics are used for farm animals. And it also brings to mind the film, What the Health, which exposes organizations like for-profit hospitals and many non-profit organizations that actually put money before what's in the best interest of humans. I highly recommend checking out that documentary and please share this episode with anyone who might benefit and thanks for listening.